I'm like saying that Brit is my favorite fun guy. Like that's not a he's a guy. But I mean, you know, I was it. Are you googling? No. Oh. Do you have mushroom jokes? Um, they're all bad. Everyone's sort of. But there's um, there's a good one. There's a good sort of limerick. In fact, I put it in one of my books uh, that the Maine Mycological Society tells. There's a, a town in Maine that's called Muskungus. So you, that's important to know for the rest. So there was once a man from a fungus who claimed to know all that there was about fungus. He said, I should. Yeah. Here's something up. You got laugh already, so you can check it. Like, oh. There once was a there once was a fool from Muskungus who claimed to know all there was about fungus. Oh. He said, "It must be understood. I eat everything that looks good, and now he's no longer a fungus." <laughs> John said he didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> And it will be one. Yes. All right. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa. I am the president of the Wisconsin Mycological Society. Um, so, tonight's guest lecturer is Britt Bunyard. Britt has a PhD in microbiology. Is it? Microbiology, actually. Thank you. Um, and he is uh, the editor and, um, of the journal Fungi which is a wonderful periodical, and it comes out both in paper copy, and you can kind of see some of them around the tables over there, um, and then also it has like a online version, which I subscribe to, which I love, so that actually delivers right into the email. So if anyone's interested in that, look it up later. He's also the executive director of the Telluride Mushroom Festival, which is a wonderful festival in um, Telluride, Colorado, I think that's in August. Is that correct? Yes. And he also does micro tourism tours. So they go to like Chile and um, Italy and Nepal, he went to as well, right? So he travels the world, learns all about fungi. It's amazing. So he's our guest lecturer tonight. And without further ado, I am passing it off to Brent here. The Brian of the Truth is yeah, I'll just say Brent's also a longtime Wisconsin Mycological Society member. Amen. And an author of a lot of books. Yeah, let's talk. <laughs> so, yeah, you uh, are just uh, in bunch of magazines. There's free copies over there that you can grab on your way out. And then also, they, I, I brought them so long as well. And yes, I've um, been in this club a long, long time. Uh, we lived in Wisconsin for 12 years, or we got moved a couple more times. We've moved around a bunch of times. I actually was a faculty member at Carroll College for several years when we moved to Wisconsin, but I haven't been in Waukesha for it's about two years now, so I didn't even really know my way around. I recognized the river, but that was about it. So that's a big change. So uh, this presentation will probably take about, uh, there's definitely a lot of people here who are new faces that I don't recognize, but there's definitely some people here that have been in the club before me. So it's nice to see everyone here. So this uh, performance will be probably about an hour. Uh, I don't actually know because this is the first time I'm doing this one. I was all set to go and then some things happened, so I added some more photos. So you'll be sort of getting things about this, but um, you don't have to be an expert to uh, get a lot out of this. It's mostly pretty pictures and some fascinating stuff. And then, of course, uh, uh, they'll be talking about uh, zombies because everyone's excited about zombies and giant of length. And I figured I'd better start off with. Uh, images of morels because that's all really anyone can think about this time of the year is when is uh, the snow going to end and when are the morels going to end. And uh, if anyone's been around long enough, they might even recognize this kid. She's uh, a lot older than that, but she's from uh, her parents are in the Illinois Mycological Association, but both, both these two clubs have always done a lot of stuff together. Anyways, uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Oh, so uh, Actually, before we get started, I do have some sad notes to uh, mention. A uh, very longtime member, John Fetzer, just passed away recently. I was just told of his passing just a few days ago. And uh, John was uh, super nice and always had uh, nothing but nice things to say about people. He was a fixture at uh, all the social events. He would be in our, in our place. We, uh, we took over doing the summer 
uh, annual summer picnic for the WMS from John. It used to always be at John's farm. Then moved to our farm, and uh, John Petzer would be there, and he'd be at the mushroom dinners. He was uh, great love with the coronal hunting in the spring, and head of the woods hunting in the fall, and just a super nice guy. There'll be some more uh, notes about him in the newsletter that's coming up next. Um, so if you, if you uh, haven't been in the club all that long, you might not know some of the uh, long-time members of the club, but uh, certainly he was loved by everybody. There's been um, actually quite a few people of late that have passed away. It's been uh, uh, kind of sad. Last November, we lost another long-time member, Tom Volk, one of the greats of uh, North American uh, mycology. He lived over in La Crosse, and uh, he would do stuff in uh, the Madison area with our uh, the, w, the WMS would be at events over there, as well as on the national scene. And then, of course, there's been the pandemic. So probably uh, most people in here know someone that died from the pandemic. I certainly do. So there's been a lot of stuff that's really gotten a lot of people down, besides the fact that we couldn't get together and meet. And then uh, even more recently, there's been a lot of uh, other bad news. I don't need to like, totally bump them out on all these slides, but it's going to get good, I promise you. There's gonna, you stick through all of the bad stuff, there's going to be some happy stuff. Uh, here pretty soon, but uh, just uh, wanted also to mention the the war in Ukraine right now that's killed hundreds of thousands of people and displaced millions of refugees. And then just you know a few days ago, this earthquake that hit uh, oh. Turkey and Syria, and the last I heard, there was over forty thousand people killed. You know, the town I used to live in, Germantown, Wisconsin, forty thousand is twice the population of Germantown. The town I live in now, Batavia, Illinois, that's twice the population of my town. It's just the south. Uh, I, I think most of Istanbul was spared because it was pretty far away from where the uh, earthquake was, but it's one of the most beautiful cities. Just a few months ago, I was just there on a stopover coming back from uh, trekking in Nepal, and just a uh, spectacular place, so much history there, thousands and thousands of years old, and now you know a lot of it's in ruins. So it's just been a lot of sadness happening. Um, in addition to you know the biggie that's been in the news a lot lately is uh, global climate change. So it seems like all of the news outlets, of course, have been constantly talking about climate change, and you know obviously to fix this problem is going to take uh, human ingenuity. But a lot of the fixes for some of the problems brought up by climate change, believe it or not, people are already worked on fixing with fungi. Mm -hmm. And just like all of the other scientific outlets, fungi magazines had. Uh, stuff on people working with fungi in trying to uh, help the planet, help the environment, et cetera. And I'll show you a couple of things about what I'm talking about in just a second. But, um, you know, just in the, uh, just to further bum you out, just uh, in the, in my very short lifetime, I'm 56, just in my lifetime, we've gone from like 2 million people on the planet to over 8 billion, you know, and uh, now every 12 years, we're adding another billion people to the planet. Isn't that amazing to think the population is growing so quickly? Uh, and just in the last 500 years, which is not a, a very long time uh, in geological uh, time frames, in the last 500 years, we've added 500 million to, we've gone from 500 million people to 8 billion people. Astounding. We now consume 70% more than the actual productivity of the planet. Will allow. So we're consuming more productivity than the planet actually makes in a sustainable fashion, meaning we're outstripping resources. Um, the planet's expected to add another 2 billion people in the next 30 years, which is when the population of the world. Hey, Joe. Hey, Brett, how are you? The population of the world in, in the next 30 years is supposed to hopefully level off. Right, you know. And that's Egypt. about what carrying capacity is. Maybe a little free. About carrying capacity were is building to be. Uh, and the scientific uh, front, it's astounding that despite how it doesn't seem like there's really any place on the planet we haven't been, and the planet's getting smaller and smaller, uh, we still don't know a lot about a lot of the organisms on the planet, believe it or not. Uh, scientists estimate that of all the organisms that are, that are on the planet, we only have names for about 1% to 10% of the so the vast majority of organisms on the planet, we have no idea what they are, we have no names for them, and probably have never even seen them. How do scientists know this? Well, you can uh, quickly uh, locate DNA in the environment, in the soil, other places, and uh, sequence uh, do sequence analysis of this and blast it with uh, libraries of sequences of all the known organisms. 
and you quickly find that this sequence doesn't match up to anything we know, yet we know it's a fungal sequence or a plant sequence or a bacterial sequence. So uh, that's one evidence. The other evidence is that all the scientific journals that publish new names of species and their descriptions uh, have still continued publishing the same number, if not more, of new species every year, you know, that they have been for the last couple hundred years. It hasn't slowed down. You know, there's not a lot of big mammals found anymore, but sometimes there are. And it's mostly bacteria and uh, fungi and smaller things. But for sure, there's still large organisms found every once in a while on the planet. And uh, as you know, we're in the midst of the, the biggest extinction event, the worst extinction event ever. So in summary, the planet's getting smaller and hotter and resources are dwindling and fires are burning up ever more chunks of land. So what to do? Again, it's going to take human ingenuity to fix the problem, but it's also going to take organisms that are already on the planet, like fungi, to uh, repair and get things back on keel. We had an issue of Fungi Magazine uh, just from about a year ago, that was devoted to all these different sorts of threats on the planet, like overpopulation and this uh, pointer. I don't think it'll show up very well in here, but you know, pesticide use, over uh, use of agriculture, urbanization, pollution, and especially plastics, invasive species. These are the things that that are in the news all of the time and are contributing to big problems on the planet. Uh, all of the different stories we covered in this issue of Fungi Magazine also had fungal solutions to these problems. Believe it or not, there's people that are studying fungi right now that can break down plastics into all sorts of other inert um, organic molecules. There's fungi that can combat invasive species that are wiping out plants and agriculturally uh, important uh, crop plants and things like this. Uh, instead of using so many insecticides, there's lots of work on biocontrols of pests and reducing insecticide, and on and on, deforestation fires, uh, rebuilding forests after fires using fungi. Um, all, all these different topics have people that are working on fixing these problems using fungi. It's a very exciting time to be a mycologist, probably the most exciting time um, ever to be a mycologist, really. So, and there's, there's a lot of bad news, but if you watch in the news and scientific publications, there's good news as well. So uh, when I was a kid, the very first time that I saw uh, uh, West Indian or Florida, or also the Florida sea manatees up close, I was totally hooked. I knew I wanted to study manatees. They were so bizarre and strange, and they seemed like they couldn't even be real. I, I just couldn't believe how cool and amazing they were. They're very gentle. You could swim right up with them. Uh, down in Florida, and I think you probably still can. Um, at the time, uh, the population was dwindling, and when I was in high school, it was very sad because the population of this species got down to something like a thousand or maybe seven hundred individuals, and they were already, they were predicted to go extinct within a couple more decades. But just in uh, like two weeks ago, there was a story in one of the magazines I get, uh, Smithsonian or something how the population, because of people getting together and setting aside habitat and you know, doing a number of different things that weren't a big deal, but basically just allowed these creatures just to do their own thing as they always had been. The population has been exploding. The population has bounced back so much that now there's, we're really running out of space in some of these preserves for them in Florida. Has anyone heard about this? It's really stunning. The population's exploded. Same with some whale species just yesterday in my news feed. There was a, a boat, like a National Geographic tour or something like that, and they're crossing the ocean and encountered uh, the largest pod of whales that's probably ever been seen by humans since the 1700s. They estimate there were more than 1,000 in this pod. And it was more than one species. And in watching the news feed, the experts that were on the ship were saying, well, this is how you can count how many whales are here. Uh, whales come up to breathe every so many minutes. If you look around, you can count how many puffs of steam were in the air that they last you know, 10 seconds or something. So you can quickly kind of count, uh, based on the number of puffs, how many whales are in this group. And you'd like, there's, you know, certainly uh, over a thousand right here. And was, what I just said, he was like, uh, no one has seen uh, pods of whales this big since basically at the time when people started really settling and colonizing North America, which is pretty astounding. So there's definitely some good news. It's not all bad. Uh, didn't mean to bum you out at the beginning. And about the discoveries of big creatures, here's a tree. I don't know if you've ever heard of this tree. I'm totally infatuated with this tree. It's the rarest tree on earth. 
Wolimia nobilis, so Wolimia pinus. Anyone heard of this? Mm -hmm. This tree is sort of like these monkey puzzle Ericaria trees. It's related to them, but it's an entirely different genus. It's known from fossil record, but it had never been seen until the 1990s. They found a canyon of these in Australia, old growth trees. There are thousands of specimens, old growth sites. They've been there for, they're, they're a thousand years old, some of these trees. No one had seen them before. And it's not like in the most remote part of the world. It's in Australia, just about two to three hours drive from Sydney. Isn't that crazy? How, how could this not be, how could this not be known? So anyways, um, the trees now are, can be uh, grown. And so uh, I don't think there's really any risk of them going extinct. Um, you can even see them in botanic gardens around them. It's a pretty bizarre tree, Wolimia nobilis. Some other rare things on the planet that, uh, or at least we thought were rare and aren't necessarily rare. This is what was long time considered the rarest mushroom on earth. Have you ever heard of it? It's the Pleurotus nebrodensis. It's one of the oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus nebrodensis. Nebrodensis because it comes from the Nebrodo forest of Italy, which is a big forested area on the side of Mount Etna in Sicily. This is the largest active volcano in Europe. And it's also a great place for mushrooming. And that's where this thing uh, grows. And it's uh, all it's it's considered critically endangered for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the habitat loss, like a lot of uh, organisms, but also because it's so tasty that people have basically eaten it into extinction, like a passenger. Oh, oh, oh. So some oyster mushrooms, those oyster mushrooms around here you're familiar with, grow on rotting wood and things like that, and you can even cultivate some. Everyone's probably everyone's collected oyster mushrooms. I know. If you've not collected a wild oyster mushroom, you can raise your hand. They're like embarrassingly like. Okay, so for sure you will this year, right? So you'll, you'll take them out and they can oyster mushrooms. Because oyster mushrooms in the store, they're okay. Oyster mushrooms from the wild are big and meaty and have a really strong smell. And you can't imagine how good oyster mushrooms can be unless you've had uh, wild ones. Anyway, um, some oyster mushrooms don't grow like ours. Some grow from, from plants in the... Uh, sorry, I'm going to the crap out. Some uh, fruit from plants like this guy up here. It's a type of an Apiaceae type species. So it's like a wild carrot or wild anise. It lives inside the plant, believe it or not, and then uh, grows on the dying tissues and then fruits at the base of it. Whoa. And you'll find uh, these types of oysters in Mediterranean parts of the world in California. In any case, mm -hmm. this guy here, Pleurotus nebrodensis, the rarest mushroom on earth. It's been eaten to almost extinction. And I can tell you, it's delicious because I've eaten it. It's like eating whales. Isn't it? It's like eating a whale baby. Actually, I've eaten it because um, it's now cultivated. Isn't that cool? People can now cultivate this. And we even had one of our culinary features a couple issues ago in Plenty Magazine even featured this, uh, featured some dishes made with this guy. And uh, you can find it around in some stores now. It's, it's getting to be more and more popular. Um, the other good news about it is uh, doing DNA sequence analysis in the environment. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, John Rico Frank, uh, John Franco Vasquez, a famous mycologist in Italy, he's actually found that this mushroom is still pretty common uh, throughout mainland Europe where it's Mediterranean. It just doesn't always fruit all that often. So he can find the, the fungus in the soil and in other plants, but just not the fruit body. So, and some mushrooms are kind of weird like that. So, anyways. Um, I didn't actually eat an endangered species. It's mm -hmm. it's safe, but it's it's totally delicious. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is that Wollemi Pine Canyon. You might notice something weird about this canyon. The green part is where the Wollemi Pines are. The brown is all burned up. So no sooner than they found this unbelievably rare tree, the rarest tree on Earth, in the 1990s, that the very next year they're starting to die because humans wanting to see this thing unwittingly were tracking pathogenic uh, fungi into the Wollumi pine forest that were attacking the trees. They'd never seen humans nor fungi on our clothing and skins before. So they were starting to get killed off by fungus, which they figured that out. And then just a couple of years ago, when the fires were sweeping all around Australia, then they got in peril again. But uh, through the work of the fire crews there to save them, uh, most of the population was spared. But you can see literally all the trees around the Wolini uh, pines growing in that canyon. Literally all the others burned out. So it was a heroic effort to save this uh, rarest tree on Earth. So 
a pretty cool story. So even when stuff's really, really bad, there's still some uh, neat stories and some successes in the news. So this last slide here of the slides that I'll call like the intro slides that are all the non-fungal related and the kind of the downer, the Debbie downers of the, the whole set um, shows a forest here bouncing back after a big fire. I don't know if this was in, uh, this was somewhere out west in uh, North America. So we found that after a fire, that's not the end of the problems. When the trees are gone, now the soil is, is very fragile. There's no trees to hold it together. So there could be flash flooding and avalanches and that'll wash away the topsoil. Well, now you're basically creating sort of a desert situation, in which case it's gonna take even longer for the trees to come back. The scientists have found that uh, fungal symbiont partners of the trees are key to getting the trees established more quickly and growing a lot more quickly and holding mm. out to the soil. And you'll be hearing a lot more about these in the future, uh, for sure, because uh, these uh, mm. these mycorrhizal fungi are becoming a, uh, a big deal. Okay, on with the show. So basically, uh, in summary, uh, to have a resilient planet in the face of all of these other changes and problems going on, we need fungi. And how fungi do this is because they help to renew and restore and revitalize both ecosystems and the plants and other organisms in the ecosystem. So fungi make soil, they're partners with plants, they can act to prevent uh, disease and other pathogens from hitting plants and other organisms in the environment, et cetera. How they do that, that's the, the point of this uh, discussion. And a lot of these tales will come from this uh, new book that I just published and came out last year, um, during the pandemic, like a lot of people locked at home, I started writing stuff. And so actually I actually had several books that came out. Anyways, this book, I only have one copy with me for a couple of reasons. One, I keep there whenever I get a batch of them, they sell out. So I have one here that you can see, but I think some other people brought it. Um, the other thing is um, the publisher offers me basically the same discount that they'll offer you. If you go to the Princeton University Press and type in the, the, uh, discount code BUN30, you can get 30% off, which means I think it ships to your house for like 20 bucks or something. And it's, as you can see, it's a pretty big book and it's hard back and everything. So it's a pretty decent guy. Anyways, this is the shameless ad for the book. Mm -hmm. So um, the point of the book is that there's a lot of stuff we don't know about fungi. What we think we know isn't always true. And a lot of the most exciting fungi are actually hidden uh, right in plain sight all around us. And there's a whole bunch of stories in the book about that, and you'll hear some of them tonight. So how fungi do their thing, how they revitalize and restore and renew the planet, build soil, these things, uh, we'll talk about now. But before you can get to talking about a little bit of what the chemistry of them is and how they operate and stuff like that, there's a few basics you have to know about fungi. For several people in the room that I recognize, It'll be a review for you because you already know this stuff. For some people, this might be new information. So anyways, uh, first thing to note about fungi is they are eukaryotes like us. Um, the, the five kingdoms of life on the planet feature bacteria, which are prokaryotes. They don't have membrane bound organelles in their cells. They're, they're single cell. Of course, they can have a cell wall or not, but they, have, uh, they don't have membrane bound organelles. All eukaryotes have membrane bound organelles inside their cells. So like fluoroplasts, ribosomes, uh, mitochondria, these sorts of things. Only eukaryotes have those. Then the eukaryotes are uh, protozoans, which are single cell, and they're plants. So plants obviously have cell walls made of cellulose and are different from the others by that virtue. Uh, animals have no cell walls. Fungi have cell walls made of tiny. And animals and fungi are most, most closely related of the, of the other kingdoms, most closely related to us. So that means uh, common ancestor, last common ancestor between a fungus and an animal was more recent than, say, a, an animal and a fungi. So a lot of things about fungi are very similar to our own. And although there's, there's uh, not very many fungal pathogens of humans, their cells are so similar to ours, it's hard to treat, you know, foot fungus and stuff like that because their, their cells and their enzyme systems, et cetera, are so similar to ours. So fungi are eukaryotes. And they're extremely diverse, and most are undescribed or still poorly known. They're, when, you, when you think about what a fungus is, you think, oh, they're more fragile than a lot of other things like plants or whatever. If it's too dry or too hot, they wither, and 
you know, they have kind of narrow set of conditions where they grow. That's true for a lot of them, but it's not true for a lot of other fungi. In fact, fungi uh, in many ways are more able to tolerate all sorts of environmental conditions than just about any other organisms. And in, in a lot of people's opinion, they're more diverse than all other forms of life. And here's an example. Up there in the top left hand corner is a picture of Antarctica. You could hike all the way across Antarctica for days and weeks, and that's what you would see. Either desert that's very much bare, a lot of rocks and dirt, or a lot of snow and ice, of course, in a lot of Antarctica. You wouldn't see much else. In that picture, I don't know how well you can see from back there. There's, there's TVs all around us. It's kind of uh, set up. You can see in that picture, besides a lot of dirt and a lot of rocks, there's a few scrubby little plants. I can't see any animals, but there's probably one or two or a few species of animals, not very many. A couple species of plants, and that's about it. But actually, there's lots of fungi there. Fungi are pretty much the dominant organism there. Isn't that incredible? It's extremely cold and dry and very intense ultraviolet light. Almost nothing else can live there. Because where, the, where is it? And where is it? Yep. Yeah. So well, where are the fungi? I don't see them. Well, it's it's uh, tough to make a living on the surface here because it's so hot and dry and so windy and so much UV. So most of the fungi that are living there are actually living inside of the rock, believe it or not, as lichens. And a lichen is a symbiotic partnership between several different organisms, fungus mostly, and then a few different photosynthetic organisms. There can actually be two different types of fungi. This was just discovered. Uh, just a few years ago. But anyways, if you were to break open those rocks that you see there, you'll see these bands of colors. People have known about these bands of colors for years. There's been uh, explore, explorers go across the Arctic, go across, I mean, you can see this in alpine areas too. Break open rocks, there's these weird colored bands. It wasn't known what was in these bands until not all that long ago. Someone decided, if that's something alive, what if I scrape it and shake it in a test tube and see what comes out and check for what organic molecules are there. Turns out it's living stuff inside the rock and just under the surface so that uh, light hitting the rock uh, gets turned, you know, photosynthesis happens in here inside this layer just below the surface. Isn't that amazing? So even in the harshest places on earth, you can find fungi. So again, um, the, the whole point of this book was that there's a lot of stuff people think they know about fungi. Uh, but it turns out the more scientists look into it, a little bit more to the story. And then a lot of the coolest fungi are hidden uh, right in plain sight. And so most of the fungi I show you tonight will be stuff that's all around you, even at your house. You've never seen it. It's right there. It's super common. So you just have to look for them. Okay, so a uh, couple more basics to know here about fungi, or at least what we think we know or what you probably thought you learned. And it ain't necessarily so. If you learned anything about fungi in, uh, oh, what time is it? Oh, what time do I have to stop? Uh, Are we done? Uh, that was great. What was that great? Uh, eight. Okay. The technical library is open until 8.30, so we might be able to. Okay. So it's up. So if you learned about anything having to do with fungi in high school, which, which you probably did, because they never really bothered to tell about budget. What you probably learned was they rot stuff. You know, they rot stuff and break things up. And isn't this great? Because without budget, we'd be buried under uh, a lot of stuff. And there's actually some truth to that. Um, before fungi came along on the planet, that rot, you know, it broke down plant material. The stuff pretty much did pile up and turn into fossil fuels. Once the fungi came along that could rot fungi, uh, that's when we really stop seeing a lot of fossil fuels being made. So there's a little bit of truth to that. However, uh, that all or most fungi are saprobes or decomposers or rot things, um, that's actually not true. The vast majority of fungi do not rot things, break things up. The vast majority are biotrophs, which means they have they live in a partnership with living organisms, not dead organisms. And meaning they're either like a beneficial organism or a, a parasite or a pathogen or something like that. That's what most fungi do. But the ones that do break down stuff, here's how they do it. If you've been walking around in the woods before and you've seen rotted logs, you probably have seen things like these two photos, right? You've seen really well rotted wood that was white and stringy, or you saw well rotted wood that was kind of reddish brown and kind of blocky and falling apart. You probably just assume, well, you know, it's obviously rotting. 
and depends on what kind of wood it was, uh, determine how it breaks down into white and stringy or, or brown and blocky. You probably thought that, right? Yeah, most people would. That's not actually why that is. The reason it is like it looks like that is because the type of fungus that got into the wood and broke it down. And so basically the, the fungi that rot woods are of two different kinds. And these are, um, I have a, a number of examples here of mushrooms that are familiar with probably most people in the room. So so-called brown rot fungi, fungi that rot wood and leave this brown look to it. And it's kind of blocky. Brown rot fungi break down the cellulose. So that's the cell wall material that holds uh, all the cells together in sort of a tight, you know, formation of wood. These fungi break down the cytos, but they don't break down the lignin. The lignin is the material that holds the cells kind of glued together in thin. Turns out cellulose, the material for cell walls, and lignin, the sort of the glue that holds the cells together. Those two different molecules are really huge. It takes a lot of different machinery to break them down. The fungi typically don't do both very well. They do one or the other. So the fungi that break down the cellulose, take away the white material, leave behind a lot of the lignin in this blocky fashion. And that's actually why soil is, is mostly brown. Believe it or not, there's a lot of lignin left behind in the soil. The fungi that are brown rotters are all basidiomycetes, no ascomycetes. So these are mushroom type fungi, including uh, the red belted uh, polypore, Homitopsis pinicola, Folinus species, those are polypores. I have it highlighted along with this guy down here because you're going to see them again in just a second. Things like the sulfur shell for chicken of the woods, Lidoporus, Phaelus chinitsii, the dyer's polypore, those are all brown rock fungi. When they get into the wood first before other microbes, they can break it down the way they want. And when they're done, the wood will look like this. There'll be lots and lots of uh, lignin left behind, all the cellulose is gone. If, on the other hand, the log is attacked, by so-called white rock fungi, they gobble up the lignin and some cellulose and leave uh, a lot of cellulose behind. So the wood looks white and stringy. And fungi that do this sort of rot, the white rock fungi, these are things like the honey mushroom, or malaria, oyster mushrooms, ganodermas, the artist conchs, uh, trimedes, which is the turkey tail, xylarias, the zyza, and also this little guy here colored uh, chorus saboria. So again, the two uh, genus names that are in color is in the case I'm going to show you what they look like here in just a second. So I mentioned the Folinus, and just to back up, Folinus is a brown rock fungus, it's a polypore, and it was up here. So Folinus forms uh, comps on the sides of trees. This is an aspen tree, probably in Colorado, but we have aspen trees here, and we have all kinds of polypores. Everyone's seen polypores on the side of a tree, right? That's the, the, the reproductive structure, that's the mushroom. Underneath are pores, like the openings of little tubes, and this is where the spores come out. And this is really the only part of the fungus you ever see. The rest of the body of the fungus is inside the tree, rotting away the heartwood, which is all dead materials so the tree probably doesn't mind a whole lot. And in any case, this is, this is pretty much our only encounter with this guy. Wouldn't it be cool if you could actually go inside the tree and see what's going on on the other side of the comp? Well, through the miracles of uh, AV, we can do that. So if you were to rip one of these conchs off the side of the tree, what you would see is where the conch is attached, there's a lot of really far gone rotted wood, not much left of it. But there's also something else you notice. See where the red arrows are? And where those red arrows are, you can see kind of black lines going down through the wood. If you're into woodworking or wood turning, you probably know wood that has these black lines and all of our patterns is called spalted wood. So if you've ever heard of uh, bird's eye maple or curly maple or things that people make guitars, cabinets, bowls out of, there's no such thing as a bird's eye maple or a curly maple. That's maple that has a fungus in it. And the fungus is duping it out with other fungi and the tree. And because they duke it out with chemicals rather than their fists, uh, this is how they do it. So this fungus got in through a wound of the tree. You can see where this guy's coming out. There's a dead branch here. There's probably a wound here. Maybe that's where the fungus entered. And it's probably maybe rotting this area here. Or maybe it's rotting a big area. I don't really know. But when it gets inside the tree, it starts rotting the wood. And the mycelium actually is growing through the wood. You can't see it. But where it runs into... Uh, the tree setting up a line of defense against the fungus or maybe other microbes, 
They will then lay down melanized layers. Melanin, just like you're in your skin that protects your skin from, from UV uh, you know, attack and other chemicals, fungi have melanin as well. And so where these two fungi meet, or other microbes meeting the fungus, they will melanize the wood. So if you could imagine that in three dimensions, there's now like you know a 3D zone in here. Inside the zone, that fungus, uh, that's gonna be fungal food. Nothing can get through this melanized uh, zone that's been walled off. And in fact, if you look closely, you can even see a lot of times the color of the wood is usually slightly lighter color. It's kind of been leached out a little bit. In any case, that's what's going on here. So when people make all kinds of pretty objects out of spalted wood, all these different lines and things, those are from different microbes, especially fungi setting up shop. Some fungi uh, stain the wood inside the spalted area a pink color. I forget which species does that. Chlorosaboria stains the wood this blue-green color. Um, this uh, photo here is by this uh, wood, uh, forest pathologist at Oregon State University, Sarah Robinson. She cultivates all these different types of spalting fungi and inoculates them into blocks. And so that's how she gets all kinds of different cool packs. You often just get one mm -hmm. uh, pattern. You can see here the woods bleached out where the fungus was, and then there's the spalted lines, and then there's the, the rest of the uh, undamaged wood there. Do you know who Joe McFarland is? Joe McFarland made that I from the heat early in the spalted wood. He's a, a naturalist down in Southern Illinois. So anyways, everyone's seen spalted wood before, right? Did you know they had a, a, a fungus going at it? Yeah, most people don't. If you uh, are into religious icons and artwork and things, uh, artwork in churches in Europe, a long time ago, hundreds of years ago, there would often be scenes depicted behind the altar, maybe in a triptych or something, and there'd be wood inlay that was different colors, and the artist had their you know, special colleague that knew about this and would go out and gather green oak or you know, whatever types of wood they called it. Again, it wasn't a type of a species of oak. It was wood that was being rotted by chlorosaboria or these other fungi, and they knew where to look, and the wood's still intact, and they could uh, turn it into these uh, real, real pretty items. I have a piece of Tunbridge ware, which is a wooden box with uh, wood inlay, all these little pieces, and it came from Britain in, well, a little over 100 years ago, and they knew about that uh, at the time as well. So they forced scenes and things or, or 3D looking patterns with wood that have been attacked by these different fungi. So pretty cool. But you don't have to go in the woods uh, and kick over logs to look for this. You can see all sorts of other woody materials that are rotted by fungi that makes that do the spalting phenomenon. And so here's the most extreme small example. Needles falling off a pine tree at your house and sitting on the ground right now demonstrate this. This fungus that you've probably never heard of, Lophodermium pinastri, one of the most common fungi on earth. And who's ever heard of it? No one. This little fungus, the whole, the whole reason for being is it lives inside of pine needles while they're still in the tree and alive. When they fall off, that's when the fungus starts rotting them. And how it rots them is just like those uh, the spalting that I just showed you with the logs. They're inside the needle and they wall off an area to keep its little section, there's the other line, keep its little section separate from this guy's section. Isn't that wild? You can see the little black lines there. And then in between, this is the colony of this one single individual. And then these are the fruit bodies. It produces these little pustules on the blast spores up into the air, reinfects the pine tree. That's but it does. Isn't that wild? Mm -hmm. But you can see where the arrows are, and even other places where there's no arrows. You can see all these little black lines. So those are little spalted lines. This is going on at your house right now. It's just pretty fascinating. Okay, so um, we've established that the majority of fungi actually don't rot things, even though we just looked at a few that do. But the majority of fungi are biotropes. They live with or on or inside of living organisms. And they can be beneficial, or they can be uh, pathogen parasites. So a um, few more fun, uh, fungal basics. So first off, the word symbiont, you see symbiont used all the time. Most people think it means uh, like a beneficial partner. It doesn't mean that. It, it, I mean, it could mean that, but it doesn't have to. Symbiont is just an organism 
that lives intimately with another organism. So pathogens, parasites, those are symbionts of their host. And so if it's something that is uh, beneficial to both, that type of a symbiont is called mutualist. So the way it goes with fungi, most of the biotrophic partners that they associate with are plants. And that could mean a disease situation or a mutualistic situation. Uh, with animals, it's sort of not, fun, not fungi, it's mostly bacteria. We, most of our diseases are bacterial, most plant diseases are fun. It's just the way it goes. And of all of the different uh, biotropes or symbionts, if you want to call them that, uh, most uh, probably are parasites, believe it. And this sort of follows along with uh, most of the life on the planet. Most, most species of organisms on the planet, believe it or not, are parasites. So that's just the way it goes. Um, and then uh, one final note, yes, when, under this topic, we'll see some zombies because everyone's been uh, watching this. What is this, Last, Last of Us? Yeah, you, know, you were watching it. So several people sent me some questions. They wanted to see if some, are there such things as zombie fungi and can you show us some? So I said, yeah, I'll show you some. So they really are real. Okay, so when talking about um, uh, mutualistic symbionts and, and things that are not mutualistic, We'll cover the mutualists last because those are sort of the feel good ones. So you have to get to sort of the creepy, uh, predacious, and parasitic ones first in order to get to the mutualists, which will be at the end. But, anyways, um, as far as the uh, hosts of pathogenic fungi go, no group of organisms is safe. So, fungi attack other fungi, they attack animals, plants, bacteria, etc. They even attack slime molds. This is something that occurs around here. You've probably seen it, but you just didn't know what it was. This is Nectriopsis violacea. This is a fungus that attacks and lives off of nothing but slime molds. If you've ever seen these big fissurum type slime molds, you know, on wood chips and things like this, dog vomit slime mold, et cetera, you know, usually it's kind of a, a brighter color. Then maybe as it ages, it's kind of a peach colored, and then maybe kind of a gray color. And then it sort of just blows away as dust. And, uh, starts life someplace else. Everyone, everyone know what I'm talking about, these slime molds? Yeah, if, you, if you're not into fungi, you know, like your friends are not into fungi, if they see this, they're just like, oh my God, what is this? How can we, do we have to avert our eyes? How do we stop this sort of thing? And it's not a big deal, it's just doing its thing. Anyways, if you ever see one of these slime molds that has a strange color that looks more kind of purple blue, uh, get it under the hand lens, take a look at it because this is probably Nectriopsis. This photo wasn't taken here in the Midwest, but I have several photos of this in, from Wisconsin as well as Illinois. Has anyone ever seen this? John, you've seen it? You ever heard of it? I did just recently. Okay. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's um, it's one of those things. It's another one of those sponges that's hidden in plain sight. Many collections of viscera from the old ex slime mold experts were identified as like, what's the, what's the viscera polycephalum? I think this, yeah, viscera polycephalum, I think is like the common many headed slime mold. Order. If you go back in the literature, there's viscera polycephalum variety ceruli or something. They were collected by experts in a blue color, a blue variant, but it wasn't a blue variant. It had this, this growing on it. They just didn't know. Ooh. Isn't that wild? So even the experts have been fooled by this thing. So uh, be on the lookout for this. Uh, here's some other things that also you've probably seen. You just thought it was a regular mold. On the underside of polypores, like artists come here, sometimes they'll be moldy. You know, maybe they were lying on the ground and they really are being rotted by some of the cold, but sometimes they're not. If they're still pretty fresh and solid feeling, but they seem like they have a, a whitish or brownish mold underneath, uh, this one I think was collected in Wisconsin. Um, check it out because it might not be rotting, the polypore, it might be a species of a fungus called sporophagomyces. That basically means spore-eating fungus. Sporophagomyces mm. species uh, land on top of the, the spore that lands on top of the ground. It starts growing, creeps underneath, and just hangs out under there. And as the spores are raining down and falling out of that Ganoderma, it catches them and eats them. That's all it means. Just spores from Ganodermis. Isn't that wild? This picture on the left, that was given to me by Dan Linder, who's a longtime friend of, a, of several people in this club. He works up at the Forest Products Lab in Madison. 
and he's seen it numbers of times in the course. So be on the lookout for this. If an oldie moldy polypore comes into the table at a foray and you're about ready to scold the newbie for bringing in old John, take a look at it first. It might, it might not be John. It might be John, but it might not. You see a lot of John. Here's some other stuff that's pretty common around here, but again, you would Ooh. never notice it. Uh, rust fungi are really fascinating. It's a group of Basidiomycete fungi. They don't form mushrooms or anything, and they're all pathogens on plants. And a lot of different rusts do pretty clever things to get their spores around. And as I said, they don't make mushrooms, so they have to do something else. So rust mushroom, rust fungi, uh, to reproduce without mushrooms, what they do is they're inside the plant as a pathogen, and then uh, and then they cause the plant, they basically kind of zombify the plant. They cause the plant to make these sort of rosettes of leaves that often are a bright color, like the picture at the top, they're bright yellow. You can see the actual flowers there. This is an actual inflorescence on the left. This is an inflorescence here. This is, these are not inflorescences, but these uh, pseudo flowers caused by a rust. So uh, the fungus makes plant hormones that causes the growth of these structures that look kind of like a flower, not so much to you and me, but to pollinating insects. And furthermore, these leaves have these pustules on them of spores, which leak out kind of a sweet nectar, much like the flowers themselves leak out a nectar and entice pollinators. So the pollinating insects are attracted to these uh, pseudo flowers, as they're called, lap up all of this nectar, pick up spores and move on to the next flower that they, that they pollinate. And then of course that inoculates that flower with the spores from this rust. There's hundreds of species of rust fungi I know that do this sort of thing. They form these different types of pseudo flowers, uh, root looking things on ericaceous plants like blueberries and, and species of vaccinium, et cetera. And in some parts of the world, people actually eat these sort of false fruits and pseudo flowers and they're actually nutritious and you know have kind of a, a pleasant taste to them. So pretty cool. Um, and then there's fungi that attack insects and kind of do the same thing with hormonal control. So this is a cordyceps. Uh, this is one of the zombifying uh, fungi. This guy attacks this uh, larvae, this caterpillar of this grass moth in Tibet. But we have lots of these different things that occur around here. More on this guy in a second, because as cool as the story is, there's even another part of the story that was just discovered that frankly is even cooler than the whole zombifying thing. But anyways, this is one of the cordyceps and what it uh, attacks. There's cordyceps that attack uh, species, other species of fungi, including truffles. And this photo was taken in Italy, but we have the same fungus here in Wisconsin and I see them quite regularly. Has anyone ever seen one of these before? If, if you're on a foray and you see a little thing sticking up about, a, about the size somewhere between like a, a wood match sticking out, pretty small, or maybe as big as your skinny pinky finger. And if you look closely, there might even be a few more of them. Don't just grab it and pull it out, you know, because it looks like a mushroom. Don't just pull it out. Uh, dig around and you might find the truffle that's attached. When we were at, um, that's, what's the name of the falls on the cable where the Northwood Spray is? Yeah. So at the Northwoods Foray last fall, I took one group out to the uh, St. Peter's Dome. Yeah, and there's a little, there's a waterfalls there. Not many people go on that foray because it's kind of far out, far out. Everyone goes on the Chantrell Foray, the Black Trumpet Foray, and the, the easy stuff. Anyways, we were foraying there and it's real pretty and scenic. And so one person on our group uh, kind of climbed up kind of high on these rocks beside the falls. And there's a lot of, uh, duff from hemlock needles and stuff like that. But otherwise, it's kind of dry because it's sort of like dirt covered boulders. It's kind of bare. And I'm not entirely sure why she was, I guess maybe she was just crawling. And that's why she was uh, so close to the ground that she saw this. So she said, I see, I think it's a fungus. It's really skinny, like, you know, skinnier than my, my pinky finger. I said, really, it's probably a cordyceps. And of course, everyone's like, well, there, there's cordyceps here? I'm like, yeah, they're actually really common. It's just so small, you never see them. So she came down with one. I'm like, ah, oh, crap, you should have dug it up. That's a type that attacks a truffle. 
So I said, if you can take us all up there, there's probably lots of them. We'll probably all find them. So we went up there. We're all, in, don't you remember when all of these were found last year? I, I do remember that. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we're crawling around. And she's like, I know it was right here. And, and once your eyes got adjusted, you know, one person saw one sticking up and then the next person. And I said, dig down, you know, like four or six inches and you'll find the truffle. So sure enough, everyone was finding the truffles. And with this particular species here, it's a little easier because they have this really bright yellow rhizomore that kind of guides you to the truffle. But um, oh, everybody in the group, there was probably 10 people found at least one or two or three. So there's a whole bunch mm -hmm. of them found. It's pretty cool. So this truffle, by the way, a lack of my seeds, is really common in Wisconsin, the deer truffle. It's not an edible truffle. We do have edible truffles here, but this isn't one. But it, it's uh, edible to this uh, cordyceps here. It's a lack of cordyceps. So cordyceps attack um, truffles. This photo was taken in Wisconsin. This is a different species. In fact, this was taken at a cable with, uh, with Emily Stone, the naturalist up there. And they attack all kinds of different bugs too. Oh, so speaking of Emily Stone, so just a week ago, she sent me pictures. She was out doing a hike. Uh, if you've ever been to the North Northwoods for a uh, Emily Stone is the naturalist of the Cable Museum of Natural History. And if you haven't been, you need to go because it's the best foray in North America. It always has the most diversity of budget. It's it's crazy. Anyways, Emily was out, like I say, just a week ago. Uh, cross-country skiing, or I don't know if she was leading a group or what, but she picked some twigs and said, I found these red oak twigs with big giant fat scale insects all over them, but there's something coming off the skins, and I suspect it's probably a fungus. And she said the trees were covered with the scales, and the scales were covered with this thing. I'm like, this is super cool. So she sent me this photo here with her hand. And where the arrows are, you can see those bumps or scales. And I said, yeah, this is a type of a cordyceps, but this is the asexual or imperfect stage. This is the genus Hercitella. And this is pretty exciting because this is the only cordyceps known to attack scale insects. We have lots of ones that attack spiders, beetles, ants, caterpillars, etc. This is the only one that's known to attack scales. And furthermore, it's only ever been seen maybe a half dozen times ever, you found something that's really super rare. She's like, well, if it's so rare, how would you know about it? Like, how I know about it is because this fungus, they're trying to cultivate it as a biocontrol for all kinds of plant pests. If you have plants indoors right now, they probably have scales, right? You know what scales are like. They're these awful bumps that suck juice out of the plants. And so this is being looked at as something of really uh, importance. So she brought it in and uh, got really good photos under the microscope of it. And so you can see, sure enough, these look just like cordyceps. They got those knobs, uh, those, bu those bumpy knobs on the end of stalks, and they're coming out of these scales. I mean, it's greatly enlarged. Those scales aren't actually the size of your head. That would be, that'd be insane. It was pretty cool find, just out roaming around the middle of winter. Who would have thought fun Bunjo would be out there? Pretty cool. It doesn't make sense. Okay, so I sort of teased you with some zombie uh, fungi. So now some actual stories of zombie fungi. So this is uh, back to that Ophio cordyceps sinensis. If you want to call it cordyceps sinensis, you can. This is the one that occurs in Tibet on this grass caterpillar. So this is one of the most uh, economically important organisms on the planet. By weight, uh, it's worth way more than gold way, way more in, a, in the Eastern medicine. So when this thing's in season in the Tibetan autonomous region of China, everyone, and I mean everyone, stops what they're doing and goes into the mountains to collect this thing because it's worth so much money. Schools closed, businesses closed, everyone goes into the mountains. 85% of the GDP of Tibetan autonomous region is this fungus, 85%. It's worth so much money. And you can find these things in Asian markets. You can find them in Chicago, Hong Kong, everywhere, because it's considered to be so important to human health if you're in that Asian medicine. So what's going on here? Well, this fungus gets into the caterpillar. Uh, somehow, you know, the caterpillar is munching along the grass, I guess, breathes in the spores or ingests them. The fungus gets into the caterpillar and then uh, exerts sort of mind control on the caterpillar without killing it tells the caterpillar at the end of the season to uh, go underground 
right, to pupate like it normally would, and then it's going to emerge, you know, as a moth next year. Well, this one's not because it's dead. But while you're burrowing yourself underground, you also have to orient yourself just right so that it's beneficial for the fungus to, to exit up near the top of the head. They always are in this exact same position. They're never any other position. It's all because the fungus tells it which way. Actually, without the fungus, I think they bury themselves head down. So there's mind control going on and all this sort of stuff, and pretty cool. There's so much money in this that you've got to ask the question, are these going to go extinct? Because probably every single one that's out there is getting grabbed. And checking population numbers and how many are collected every year, we do see some uh, dwindling of numbers coming in. But it probably won't go extinct. And here's why. Again, this is worth more than gold by weight. So everyone should know the science of this organism, right? I mean, everyone's trying to grow it. You can grow the asexual form. And I think it still has the same properties in it. So something that's worth so much money, you think people would figure out. Uh, but they they had it. the mystery was how the spores get inside the fungus. They mentioned they probably breathe them in, they probably are munching the grass and ingest them. That's not how they get the fungus in them. The fungus is already in the plants. Isn't that wild? So not only can this fungus get into this caterpillar and live for the entire season inside the caterpillar without the caterpillar knowing and then exert zombie mind control on it and tell it how to bury itself by hormones that have evolved over millions of years. So finely tuned that they're just like the hormones in the caterpillar. That's pretty amazing. But what's more amazing is that before that even happened, the fungus is in the plants all throughout the entire life of the plant. And that's what the fungus does. If this caterpillar doesn't come along, it doesn't even matter. The fungus reproduces on its own. It just grows with the plants. It can live its entire lifetime in a plant or in an animal or both. That's astounding. Mm -hmm. And that was just discovered just a few years ago. Sorry, did you say that's like a physics one or an animal? What's the value of the cordyceps are one of the most prized medicinal fungi or herbs or, or whatever you want to call it of Eastern medicine. What, so, what does cordyceps do? Cordyceps does uh, everything, uh, prevents all sorts of maladies. It helps uh, brain, you know, retention. It, literally every possible benefit to the body uh, can be attributed to cordyceps. The back in the days when East Germans had these gigantic hulking athletes that won all of the gold medals in the Olympics, they were they had Chinese doctors that were giving them cordyceps and all sorts of this stuff. It's kind of hard to believe, uh, and I, I was careful not to say cured stuff because that's not how Asian medicine works. Asian medicine you don't take when you get sick from something, cancer or cold, whatever, to get cured, you take something your entire life to prevent that from happening to you. And so when you look at populations that have high cordyceps intake, healthy diet, eating a lot of nuts and fish and, and not too many um, smash burgers and stuff, people tend to live longer and the brains function more, et cetera, et cetera. So. You know what it's only harvested from the... What's that? Is it only harvested? You, I don't know if you know if it's only harvested from the larval form. Like so, yeah. So, so the question is: Is it only harvested from the larval form? So, yes. So, this fruit body only comes out of the of, when, of the caterpillar when the caterpillar is pupating, when it's going from a larva to an adult moth, and so that's the time when the cordyceps fruit body comes out. It's worth by far more money uh, if you have in the medicine shop or wherever if you have the fungus and the caterpillar attached. Yeah. So if for some reason you put it in your pocket and it breaks, it's not worth as much money. Yeah, but okay. What's that? Anacrophy. Yeah. So I mean there's, you know, um all you know, all medicine and science was anecdotal until it became fat. So uh, there's a lot of different things in cordyceps that you know really are medicines. Uh Isaria, the anamorphic state of cordyceps. Uh, that's what we get uh, organ anti-rejection uh, medicines from and things like that. So, I mean, for sure there are compounds. What else is in cordyceps? I just don't know. How about some other zombifying fungi? Oh, so here's different types of cordyceps that get beetles and moths and spiders and things. Uh, Daniel Winkler of the Puget Sound Mycological Society, he's an expert with these. Uh, these are some of his photos. This photo is from Trad Cotter, who's down in... Uh, 
South Carolina as well as Jamaica. And this is an ant. Uh, some of the ants with cordyceps on them are some of the more fascinating types of zombie fungi that have just been discovered not all that long ago. What happens here is the fungus gets inside this little ant. This guy's in bad shape and he's already kind of moldy, moldy all around here. So he's just deformed. Trad found this on his farm. Anyways, when the ants, you know, they make these little trails and when they pick up the cordyceps and the, the cordyceps is ready to kill the ant and produce this long stalk that produces the spores out of the fruit body here, mm -hmm. um, they exert zombie mind control over the ant that causes ants to climb up and hang out up directly above where the trails are, presumably raining spores down on top of it. So they're, you know, they, if the if the end is dead and near the path, the ants will actually pick it up and move it away because, uh, you know, there's no dummies. They don't want to get what that end has. But if this guy is above them, raining spores down on them, there's not much they can do. If you look uh, under the hood of what's going on here, this is uh, pretty cool mycologically. This is the ant here. This is his head and his neck. And I don't know if in uh, The Last of Us, the humans look like this as well. Do they have a big cordyceps that comes out of their necks? I haven't watched. Anyways, so the stalk produces uh, this structure up here, parathesium, and all these little bumps are like little vases. And inside each one of these little uh, vases, there's these parathesia inside the stromal tissue. That's where the spores are, and these are spores here, and they're blasted out through an opening that would be right there at the end of this bump. So that's how spores are made. Um, it's amazing as my, zombie mind control is on insects, it's actually evolved more than once. So in the zygomycete group, this is a very primitive fungi. There's lots of different species of entomophthora, which basically means insect destroyer. The genus entomophthora has all kinds of different fungi, which also kill bugs. But right before they do, they have zombie mind control as well. Tell the bug to go some sort of a place that's... Uh, uh, a great place to blast spores and contaminate others of its kind. Right now is a good time to see this particular species, Entomophthora musi. If you look around your house on the windows, you'll very often, middle of winter, see a fly stuck to a window. Did he crash into the window and get stuck? No, of course not. He got attacked by this fungus and was about to die on the windowsill, but the fungus told him, climb up as high as you possibly can and then die because that's a better place for me to blast my spores from. And if you look at the fly that's huh. stuck on the window at your house, has anyone seen me before? So I, I see them all the time, but I, I look for weird things like this. Also, our windows are really dirty in our house, so that helps. But um, if you look around these flies, you'll see that it looks like they're wearing little fur coats, and that's the entomophthora mm. erupting through the tissue and producing spores. I think maybe this is the last group to point out. These guys here are a group of fungi. This is probably the largest group of fungi. No, the Lavul Vinealis, this order of fungi. John, you ever heard of them? You have heard of Lavuls? Almost nobody's heard of Lavuls, even mycologists, even though it's the biggest group of fungi. What they do, we really don't know. We find them on insect carapaces like this. They, I guess, get some nutrition from the shell of beetles and other insects. They're little tiny guys, just two or three cells long, right along them, beetles and other insects. The neck. When that uh, insect gets together with another of its kind to copulate, they get spread and transferred throughout the whole population of the bugs. And that's pretty much what they do. They just ride around on insects and get little tiny bits of nutrition, I guess, from their exoskeleton. But stay tuned. The very next issue of Fungi Magazine will have labools on the cover, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I'm sure, the first time and maybe the last time they'll ever get on the cover of any patient nutrition. So, oh. Couple other things to point out as well from uh, around here in Wisconsin. In the in the late summer, early fall, if you're around ash trees, especially white ash trees, in the woods, even in a city park, even on a lawn, at least until the ash trees go away and they're starting to die off, right? Yeah. So maybe they're already wiped out in your area. Under the ash trees, you probably have seen this bully, right? The ash bully. It's kind of muddy brown on top. There's usually lots and lots of them. They're great big. Everyone wants to eat them because there's so many. They taste like crap. They taste like, I mean, they actually taste like crap. They taste like mud. And if you flip them over, they're kind of pretty because they have these uh, weird, veiny sort of pores underneath. Uh, when they're fresh, they're bright yellow. 
But if you see one under dash tree on the lawn, you'll see lots and lots, super duper common. Well, anyways, so like all foliates, they are mycorrhizal with the tree, right? They grow from the roots. Turns out not all foliates are mycorrhizal, and this guy isn't even a true foliate. But it does seem to be associated just with ash trees. It's not actually attached to the roots. If you were to dig around very carefully at the base of one of these mushrooms, this is what you would see at these, at these red arrows. Little like black pea-like structures. This is an aphid insect that's attached to the roots of the ash tree, stepping away. But protecting it, growing around it, is this fungus, believe it or not. And the, the aphid has to have this fungus to protect it from you know, other insects and the elements and everything. The fungus gets all its nutrition, presumably, from that little tiny little insect that's inside the skull. That's, in, that, that's the gall right there. This, that white ash trees and this mushroom, some of the most common organisms in Wisconsin, some of Wisconsin, everybody has seen this, but you probably didn't know how it was growing. Just gotta kind of dig around and look for it. So, uh, oh wait, how am I doing on time? I was gonna mention microbes. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes till questions. Oh, okay. 10 minutes, 10 minutes until questions? Yeah. Oh, that, that's a fact. Okay, so, um, uh, the Volites, uh, mostly, I mean, all, all books will say they are all uh, mycorrhizal partners with trees. That's why you have to look for certain trees when you're looking for king Volites, et cetera, in the fall. But, and it turns out not all are. But, but what are mycorrhizal fungi? So a lot of the fungi that we prize the most, Rushulas, Ammonitas, Volites, Chanterelles, Black Trumpets, et cetera, et cetera, Hedgehogs, uh, these seem to be growing from the forest floor. They seem to be growing from the soil, but they're not. They're growing from the, the roots of trees. They're farming that tree that they're attached to. And they don't just grow with every kind of tree. They're usually fairly specific. So if you're looking for chanterelles around here, you're usually looking for what? Oak trees, yeah. If you're looking for ammonitas, certain types of oak trees, but some partner with other species as well. But in any case, what's going on is you're plucking them from the soil thinking they're growing from soil, but they're actually attached to the ends of the roots of the tree because it turns out the fungus is what's bringing the, the nutrients and the moisture into the tree. We learned in school, tree roots are pretty amazing because you know, they bring in all of the stuff from the environment, but it turns out the tree root really doesn't do much at all. It's pretty much just a stem that holds the tree down so it doesn't blow away. The fungus in the roots is what's doing the heavy lifting. If you were to rip the trees out of the soil, which I don't recommend you do, but if you did, what you would see at the tips of the roots, they're usually fat and moldy looking. These are little baby bristlecone pine seedlings that I was planting at my, my house in Wisconsin. When I dug them up in Colorado to bring them home with a hand lens, I could easily see the mycorrhizal fungi on the, the tips of the roots. There's, there's little moldy tree roots all along here. Oh yeah, and blown up there. So what's going on here is the fungus is actually what's doing the heavy lifting for the plant. In these images here, these seedlings grown against like a pane of glass in a tank. Here's what you see. Um, to this edge right here, that's the extent of these little seedlings root. All the rest of this out here is fungus. Same here. This little seedling, its roots go right to maybe here. All the rest of this is fungus, believe it or not. It's its mycorrhizal partner. It's in the scale. It basically attacks the roots, sort of like a parasite, but it brings in all of the goodies, water, and nutrients to the tree. Knowing this, you can you know, set up tree farms and reforest areas quicker. Not knowing this leads people in the past to have attempted to plant seedlings of trees, millions and millions of them, outside of their native habitat and waste a lot of time and money because. The, the tree's not doing the growing, it's the, the fungus is farming the tree. Well, so what happens is the tree does the photosynthesis and gives carbohydrates to the fungus. The fungus gives nutrients like potassium, nitrogen, magnesium, iron, water to the tree. And it vastly uh, increases the surface area of the roots out of the soil. This is all very well established now. So if you've never heard the term before, mycorrhizal, this is one of the hot areas of, of study right now. This is also the reason why you can't grow things real cheaply like truffles. How come truffles are so expensive? Can't you just farm them? Well, no, you can't farm them. You can farm the trees that they grow on, maybe, and get truffles. Well, some people are doing that. Same with king bullets and chanterelles. 
uh, these mycorrhizal partnerships with uh, are with a lot of the mushrooms and, and plants that we uh, see all around us. So truffles, rushulas, species of Amanitas, Cortinarius, these are all mycorrhizal. Trichilomas, like the Matsutake there, the upper left. Lacaria, this is sort of like one of the weeds of, of all the forests around the planet. Um, almost all bald eat species are mycorrhizal, including that Lexinum, chanterelles, black trumpets, hedgehogs, and even some more else species seem to be mycorrhizal, which means, again, you, they don't rot things. You can't cultivate them. They grow from trees. They have a partner. And in fact, when we look at what's growing in the forest, you would be very surprised to see that about half of all the Basidiomycete fungi we know of are mycorrhizal. Many of our popular edible species, a lot of Ascomycete fungi are too. And Ascomycete is the biggest group by far. And uh, on the plant side, probably 90% or more of all plant species are mycorrhizal, means they have to have a fungal partner. And as best as we can tell, 100% of all trees are mycorrhizal. So again, you can't just uh, grow them anywhere. They, they rely on these fungal partners to, to grow in an obligate uh, uh, association. So with that, that was that's the end of my talk. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? So if you guys have any questions on anything you went over, feel free to ask them. And then after this, um, if you want any more information on WMS as a whole, um, we're gonna have our WMS table back there with all of our t-shirts and everything. Also, probably membership sign-up sheets for anyone who might not be a member already. And then remember that Britt has all of his uh, magazines and his books on sale over at his table as well. So Yeah, magazines are free. Grab one on your way out. And that was from earlier last year. It was the Ethnomycology uh, Special Edition. And the books are deeply discounted. And I can take cards. Except for short cards. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, first. So I garden a lot, and you can now buy bags of soil with this Michael Rise and stuff. Yeah. Do you have an idea of what's really in there? So, you know, this is an interesting uh, topic. The question was, you could buy bags of soil that's already been amended with mycorrhizal fungi. What's in there? So I, I do have some questions about what they put in these mixes, because sometimes they're mixed out west and then sold in the east, or mixed in the east or sold in the west. There's also some boxes now. I know Fungi Perfecti was uh, selling stuff in boxes, just regular cardboard boxes. They were already pre-inoculated with fungus, with spores. So the, the, the box would say, once you're done with this, don't recycle it. Just tear it up into pieces and bury it at your house or throw it in the compost pile. And the fungus will uh, move on out of the cardboard into your soil and into the soil. So I've actually looked to see what the list of the species are. And a lot of them are things that don't occur around here. And they're from... The West, so I'm not really sure if this is a good idea because uh, you could be moving things out of their environment. Typically, they are uh, pizzolithus, that uh, and then it's what or dog turd fungus, it's also called pizzolithus and uh, and uh, thalephora uh, species, thalephora terrestris. These are things that park with a lot of different types of trees, so they would get established pretty easy on the plus side, but. If, at the same time, you know, it might not be something that you want to spread around. So I don't know how that's going to pan out. Yeah. And would it just make worse? I mean, obviously, the fungus and all that thing about soil, it's different types. If you, you know, if you were composting stuff already in your house, you're making a favorable, favorable environment. Stuff will move in. I mean, you know this because if your uh, compost pile is sitting there for a while or just wood chips or whatever, and you go to turn it, you'll see the mycelium in there. It'll look furry and hairy, and that's you know it's a it's a good habitat. There's uh, juicy stuff in there to eat. So if you just make the habitat all don't come in, way in the back. Um, I'm going to sell them these packaged soils. Do they? I mean, do, don't they have some sort of responsibility to like check where they are sending this? Uh, it's, yeah, another question along the same lines. I don't think there's anybody that. I don't think there's any uh, rules or guidelines or anything. This is all still pretty new territory. And... Well, as far as like fungi and regulation, it's, it's really difficult. Like, um, 
you know, handling regulation, but just like you think that the time the start company is going to do this would have space to have like oh, invasive, <laughs> right? But like, Why not? So the people in this room probably have more knowledge of like an invasive fungal species than like most of the people outside of this room, right? Like, you know, there was that bench that someone bought in like Madison or something, and they took it up to like northern Wisconsin, up to like Madeline Island, and then it started growing golden oysters. And golden oysters were not there or invasive, and now they're probably going to be there because of how like they're very, very prolific and very, very successful in pretty much every environment they go into. So, like, you know, the person that was making that bench might have had no idea that it was in there, but it was, you know. So, I think that we as consumers are kind of the best, you know, gauge of that. Like, if you're going to buy wooden furniture to make sure that it's like heat treated and that you know where it's coming from. Um, and same with plant life, like if you can go to a local, you know, greenhouse where someone's like growing heirloom type stuff, it's going to probably be better than buying stuff in the big box because stuff like that is possible. Hey, Aaron Corbett. Hi. Hey, Aaron Corbett. Hi. Grant, at the beginning of the lecture, I was surprised that you said that uh, most fungal species were parasitic or tertiary. Uh, most most fungi I know are biotropic. You're biotropic. Yeah, biotropic as opposed to uh, like a saccharin. So it would be parasitic and like neutrals. So either like mycorrhizal with a tree or parasitic, yeah. so like lumping them into one category, oh, depending on yeah. like. Yeah, as opposed to things that just rot stuff. Okay, okay. I thought you were. I thought what I was sharing parasitic, but you were just throwing that into the neutralistic. So, so uh, so let me show the term symbiote, symbionts, symbiotic, and most people think that that means beneficial, but it doesn't mean that actually at all. And uh, a lot of people erroneously use sim symbiotic. So symbionts are, are organisms that live in intimate association with another organism. Predator and prey, most biologists consider predator and prey symbionts. So it's definitely good for one, definitely not so good for the other. So of the symbionts, you know, which means biotropic, it's an organism that lives with a li another living organism, as opposed to saprobic, which is living with a dead organism. Okay. Yeah. So then, then I thought to myself, are, are, are all organisms symbionts? Uh, no, for sure not. So organisms, I mean, the organisms that are uh, I mean, you could be any of the autotrophic organisms that can, you know, photosynthesize or make their own food, you know, don't necessarily have to have partners. So there's a lot of bacteria and other things that can be autotrophic and, you know, not necessarily need a, a symbiont. So there's a lot of symbionts and stuff. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So... My husband is a dairy farmer, and he's always inoculated. And yeah. he he thinks my hobby is somewhat silly. <laughs> he rolls his eyes, but he also is a person that thinks happy wife, happy life. And so he's um when he's planting. There's two examples that I'm always telling him. I think you're using mycology to help you with your farming. So when he plants legumes, especially soybeans, he's inoculated. You know, the planter box like that. Um, and then the second example I have is he's inoculating when he harvests his seed, both corn, and he makes silage, and he makes haylage. And so what we're trying to do with that, we're trying to preserve it, have it ferment in yeah. an anaerobic environment because we don't want it to turn into compost. Yeah. So is he actually using fungi to preserve his feed and also to help his legumes grow Better. So yeah, the, it's interesting about the uh, fermenting hay. Uh, I remember when people started doing that in North America, because they've been doing it in Europe for a long time, in these like white tubes. And you know, when I saw it as a kid, because I grew up on a farm, and I said, even asked my dad, like, well, those white tubes, well, that's green hay they're putting here. It's not dry. Won't that rot? And he's like, I don't know. I wouldn't think it would rot. And when I, you know, then I, I went to college and was an ag student, and, and that was the new wave of North America. And it's like, no, it won't rot. If you if it gets inoculated first, 
it basically ferments, and now the pH is too low, and the other things are too high for other things to come in. So just like when you ferment stuff at your house, like uh, sauerkraut, pickles, meat, tobacco gets fermented, uh, chocolate gets lots, lots of foods get fermented, uh, sausages. The whole idea with fermenting is to make the conditions such that uh, things that would spoil it, rotting things, it's outside of their range. So it's too salt, too much salt or sugar, the pH is too low, et cetera. So the mixture that they inoculate hay with is actually a number of different microbes, fungal and bacterial, including lacto lactobacillus, which used to make pickles. With the uh, legumes, uh, those are much less mycorrhizal. Those use more mycoids fungus. They're more uh, rhizobial type organisms. So they partner with rhizobium bacteria, which are nitrogen fixing. If you have uh, if you have any sorts of legumes at your house at the end of the season, you got green beans, lima beans, bird's foot, tree foil, alfalfa, any legume plant at your house. If you pull it up at the end of the season, check your post over it, you'll see these little nodules, these little white knobs. Those are full of bacteria, which fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and take it into the plant. That's why legumes are so nutritious, because they can pull a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. They, uh, legumes can get mycorrhizal fungi, but they're not, uh, they're not ectomycorrhizal, one, like what I was showing. They're a different type of mycorrhizal, called endomycorrhizal or carbuscular. And these are actually the most important fungi on the planet. We also don't really know much about them because almost none can be cultured. But the vast majority of plants are mycorrhizal with our muscular, and they don't form mushrooms. Most don't produce a fruit body. Most don't seem to have sexual reproduction. Actually, they do other things. Why any why any fungi have sexual reproduction? I don't know. That's in my book, by the way. I put in there because it's controversial to a lot of my colleagues. Any other questions about legumes or <laughs> rotting stuff? So if not, and if you did want a book or something, I'll be around. So thanks.